before we begin, I just want to apologize for the audio quality and also for the speed in which I was talking in this particular episode. Um, I don't exactly know what I was on, but I can tell you that I was trying to just get through the play, trying to speak as thoroughly and as uh, not stumbling on my words as possible. That, in turn, I guess, caused me to be a little nervous and to speak faster because I thought, you know what, to speak thoroughly, it means I need to get through this. So I apologize for the speed at which I spoke in this particular episode. If you want to skip this play, I will not mind. Uh, It's not my best work, but I ended up editing it and everything else like that. So I figured I might as well release it, and then who knows, maybe you can rip me a new one and I can do better in the next. Anyway, on to the episode. Hello, and welcome back to Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner, where I read plays, poems, or whatever's currently striking my fancy at the moment. Today we are going to be reading another one of J.M. Singh's plays entitled The Well of the Saints, written between 1903 and 1908, a play in three acts. In this particular version, there is a preface to this play uh, by W.B. Yeats entitled Mr. Singh and His Plays. It's a bit of a lengthy one, so if you want to skip ahead, I will not mind. Six years ago, I was staying in a student's hotel in the Latin Quarter, and somebody whose name I cannot recollect introduced me to an Irishman who, even poorer than myself, had taken a room at the top of the house. It was J.M. Singh, and I, who thought I knew the name of every Irishman who was working at literature, had never heard of him. He was a graduate of Trinity College Dublin too, and Trinity College does not, as a rule, produce artistic minds. He told me that he had been living in France and Germany, reading French and German literature, and that he had wished to become a writer. He had, however, nothing to show but one or two poems of impressionistic essays— full of that kind of morbidity that has its own root in too much brooding over methods of expression and ways of looking upon life which come not out of life, but out of literature, images reflected from mirror to mirror. He had wandered among people whose life is as picturesque as the Middle Ages, playing his fiddle to Italian sailors and listening to stories in Bavarian woods, but life had cast no light into his writings. He had learned Irish years ago, but had begun to forget it, for the only language that interested him was the conversational language of modern poetry, which had begun to make us all weary. I was very weary of it, for I had finished The Secret Rose, and felt how it had separated my imagination from life, sending my red Hanneran, who should have trodden the same roads with myself, into some undiscoverable country. I said, Give up Paris. You will never create anything by reading Racine, and Arthur Simons will always be a better critic of French literature. Go to the Aran Islands. Live there as if you were one of the people themselves. He went to Aran and became a part of its life, living upon salt fish and eggs, talking Irish for the most part, but listening also to the beautiful English which has grown up in Irish-speaking districts and takes its vocabulary from the time of Mallory and the translators of the Bible, but its idiom and its vivid metaphor from Irish. When Mr. Singh began to write in this language, Lady Gregory had already used it finally in her translations of Dr. Hyde's lyrics and plays, or of old Irish literature, but she had listened with different ears. He made his own selection of word and phrase, choosing what would express his own personality. Above all, he made word and phrase dance to a very strange rhythm, which will always, till his plays have created their own tradition, be difficult to actors who have not learned it from his lips. It is essential, for it perfectly fits the drifting emotion, the dreaminess, the vague yet measureless desire, for which he would create a dramatic form. It blurs definition, clear edges, everything that comes from the will. It turns imagination from all that is of the present, like a gold background in a religious picture, and it strengthens in every emotion whatever comes to it from far off, from brooding memory and dangerous hope. When he brought The Shadow of the Glen, his first play, to the Irish National Theatre Society, the players were puzzled by the rhythm, but gradually they became certain that his woman of the Glen, as melancholy as Curlew, driven to distraction by her own sensitiveness, her own fineness, could not speak with any other tongue, that all his people would change their life if the rhythm changed. 
Perhaps no Irish countryman has ever that exact rhythm in his voice. But certainly if Mr. Singh had been born a countryman, he would have spoken like that. It makes the people of his imagination a little disembodied. It gives them a kind of innocence, even in their anger and their cursing. It is part of its maker's attitude towards the world. For while it makes the clash of wills among his persons indirect and dreamy, it helps him to see the subject matter of his art with wise, clear-seeing, unreflecting eyes, to preserve the integrity of art in an age of reasons and purposes. Whether he write by old beggars by the roadside, lamenting over the misery and ugliness of life, or of an old errand woman mourning her drowned sons, or of a young wife married to an old husband, he has no wish to change anything, to reform anything. All these people pass by as before, an open window, murmuring strange, exciting words. If one has not fine construction, one has not drama. But if one has not beautiful or powerful and individual speech, one has not literature, or, at any rate, one has not great literature. Rabelais, Villon, Shakespeare, William Blake. One would know one another by their speech. Some of them knew how to construct a story, but all of them had abundant, resonant, beautiful, laughing, living speech. It is only the writers of our modern dramatic movement, our scientific dramatists, our naturalists of the stage, who have thought it possible to be like the greatest, and yet to cast aside even the poor persiflage of the comedians, and to write in the impersonal language that has come, not out of individual life, nor out of life at all, but out of necessities of commerce, of parliament, of board schools, of hurried journeys by the rail. If there are such things as decaying art and decaying institutions, their decay must begin when the element they receive into their care from the life of every man in the world begins to rot. Literature decays when it no longer makes more beautiful or more vivid the language which unites it to life. And when one finds the criticism of the student and the purpose of the reformer and the logic of man of science where there should have been the reveries of the common heart, ennobled into some raving leer or unabashed Don Quixote. One must not forget that the death of language, the substitution of phrases as nearly impersonal as algebra for words and rhythms varying from man to man, is but a part of the tyranny of impersonal things. I have been reading through a bundle of German plays, and have found everywhere a desire not to express hopes and alarms common to every man that ever came into the world, but politics or social passion, a veiled or open propaganda. Now it is returning from the free life of the stage. Now it is dueling that has need of reproof. Now it is the ideas of an actress returning from the free life of the stage that must be contrasted with the prejudice of an old-fashioned town. Now it is the hostility of Christianity and paganism in our own day that is to find an obscure symbol in a bell thrown from its tower by spirits of the wood. I compare the work of these dramatists with the greater plays of their Scandinavian master. And remember that even he, who has made so many clear-drawn characters, made us no abundant character, no man of genius in whom we could believe, and that in him also, even when it is emperor and Galilean that are face to face, even the most monumentous figures are subordinate to some tendency, to some movement, to some inanimate energy, or to some process of thought, whose very logic has changed it into mechanism, always to something other than human life. We must not measure a young talent, whether we praise or blame, with that of men who are among the greatest of our time, but we may say of any talent following out of a definition that it takes up the tradition of great drama as it comes from the hands of the masters who are acknowledged by all time and turn away from a dramatic movement which, though it has been serviced by fine talent, has been imposed upon us by science, by artificial life, by a passing order. When the individual life no longer delights in its own energy, when the holy is not made strong and beautiful by the activities of daily life, 
when men have no delight in decorating the body, one may be certain that one lives in a passing order amid the inventions of a fading vitality. If Homer were alive today, he would only resist, after a deliberate struggle, the temptation to find his subject, not in Helen's beauty, that every man has desired, nor in the wisdom and endurance of Odysseus that has been the desire of every woman that has come into the world, but in what somebody would describe perhaps as the inevitable contest, arising out of economic causes between the country places and the small towns on the one hand, and upon the other, the great city of Troy, representing one knows not what tendency to centralization. Mr. Singh has in common with the great theatre of the world, with that of Greece and that of India, with the creator of Falstaff, with Racine, a delight in language, a preoccupation with individual life. He resembles them also by a preoccupation with what is lasting and noble, that came to him not, as I think, from books, but while he listened to old stories in the cottages, and contrasted what they remembered with reality. The only literature of the Irish country people is their songs, full often of extravagant love, and their stories of kings and of kings' children. I will cry my fill, but not for God, but because Finn and the Fiona are not living, says Owison in the story. Every writer, even every small writer who has belonged to the great tradition, has had his dream of an impossibly noble life, and the greater he is, the more does it seem to plunge him into some beautiful or bitter reverie. Some, and of these are all the earliest poets of the world, gave it direct expression. Others mingled it so subtly with reality that it is a day's work to disentangle it. Others bring it near by showing us whatever is most its contrary. Mr. Singh, indeed, sets before us ugly, deformed, or sinful people, but his people, moved by no practical ambition, are driven by a dream of that impossible life, that we may feel how intensely his woman of the glen dreams of days that shall be entirely alive. She that is a hard woman to please must spend her days between a sour-faced old husband, a man who goes mad upon the hills, a craven lad and a drunken tramp, and those two blind people of the well of the saints are so transformed by the dream that they chose blindness rather than reality. He tells us of realities, but he knows that art has never taken more than its symbols from anything that the eye can see or the hand can measure. It is the preoccupation of his characters with their dream that gives his plays their drifting movement, their emotional subtlety. In most of the dramatic writing of our time, and this is one of the reasons why our dramatists do not find the need for a better speech, one finds a simple motive lifted, as it were, into the full light of the stage. The ordinary student of a drama will not find anywhere in the well of the saints that excitement of the will in the presence of attainable advantages, which he is accustomed to think the natural stuff of drama. And if he sees it played, he will wonder why act is knitted to act so loosely, why it is all like a decoration on a flat surface, why there is so much leisure in the dialogue, even in the midst of passion. If he see the shadow of the glen, he will ask, Why does this woman go out of her house? Is it because she cannot help herself? Or is she contented to go? Why is it not all made clearer? And yet, like everybody, when caught up in great events, she does many things without being quite certain why she does them. She hardly understands at moments why her action has a certain form, more clearly than why her body is tall or short, or fair or brown. She feels an emotion that she does not understand. She is driven by desires that need their expression. Not, I admire this man, or I must go whether I will or no, but words full of suggestion, rhythms of voice, movements that escape analysis. In addition to all this, she has something that she shares with none but the children of one man's imagination. She is intoxicated by a dream which is hardly understood by herself, but possesses her like something half-remembered on a sudden 
Wakening. While I write, we are rehearsing the well of the saints, and are painting for its decorative scenery, mountains in one or two flat colors, and without detail, ash trees and red sailies, with something of recurring pattern in their woven boughs. For though the people of the play use no phrase they could use in daily life, we know that we are seeking to express what no eye has ever seen. W.B. Yeats The persons are Martin Duell, a weather-beaten blind beggar, Mary Duell, his wife, a weather-beaten ugly woman, blind also, nearly fifty, Timmy, a middle-aged, almost elderly but vigorous smith, Molly Byrne, a fine-looking girl with fair hair, Bride, another handsome girl, Matt Simmon, the saint, a wandering friar, and other girls and men. The first production was in Dublin on the 4th of February, 1905. Martin Duell is performed by W.G. Fay, Mary Duell by Emma Vernon, Timmy A. Smith by George Roberts, Molly Byrne by Sarah Allgood, Bride by Marie Nikovla, Matt Simon by P. Mac Hovla, and A Wandering Friar by F.G. Fay. The scene is some lonely mountainous district in the coast of Ireland, one or more centuries ago. The first act is in the autumn, the second towards the end of winter, and the third at the beginning of spring. Act 1. Roadside with big stones, etc. on the right. Low, loose walls at back, with gap near center. At left, ruined doorway of church, with bushes beside it. Martin Duell and Mary Duell grope in on left, and pass over to stones on right, where they sit. Mary Duell. What place are we now, Martin Duell? Martin Duell. Pass on the gap. Mary Duell, raising her head. The length of that. Well, the sun's coming warm this day, if it's late autumn itself. Martin Duell, putting out his hand in sun. What way wouldn't it be warm, and a getting high up in the south? You are that length plighting your yellow hair, and you have the morning lost on us. And the people are after passing us to the fair of Clash. Mary Duel. It isn't gone to the fair. The time they do be driving their cattle and they with their litter of pigs maybe squealing in their carts, they'd give us a ting at all. She sits down. It's well you know that. But you must be talking. Martin Duel, sitting down beside her and beginning to shred rushes she gives him. If I didn't talk, I'd be destroyed in a short while listening to the clack you do be making. For you have a queer, cracked voice, and the Lord have mercy on you, if it's fine to look on you at itself. Who wouldn't have a cracked voice sitting out all the air and the rain falling? It's a bad life for the voice, Martin Dole. Though I've heard tell, there isn't anything like the wet south wind does be blown upon us, for keeping a white, beautiful skin, like of my own skin, on your neck and on your brows, and there isn't anything at all like a fine skin for putting splendor on a woman. Martin Dole, teasingly, but with a good humor. I do be thinking odd times we don't know rightly the way you have with your splendor. I'd ask myself maybe if you have it at all. For the time I was a young lad and had fine sight, it was the one with sweet voices that were the best in face. Mary Duell. <laughs> Let she not be making the like of that talk when you've heard Timmy the Smith and Matt Simmon and Paul Ritter and the power besides saying fine things of my face. And you know rightly, it was the beautiful dark woman they did call me in Balanaton. If it was itself, I heard Molly Byrne saying at the fall of night it was a little more than a fright you were. Mary Duell, sharply. She was jealous, God forgive her. Because Timmy the smith was after praising my hair. Jealous? Aye, jealous, Martin Duell. If she wasn't itself, she young and silly do be always making game of them that's dark, and they thinking it's fine thing if they had us deceived, the way we wouldn't know we were so fine looking at all. She puts her hair to her face with a complacent gesture and smooths her hair back with her hands. I do be thinking in the long night to be a grand thing if we could see ourselves for one hour, or a minute itself. The way we know surely we were the finest man and the finest woman of the seven countries of the East. And then seeing the rabble below might be destroying their souls, telling bad lies, and we'd never heed anything they say. If you weren't a big fool, you wouldn't heed them this hour, Martin Duell. For they're a bad lot, those that have their sight. And they do have a great joy at the time they do be seeing a grand thing, to let on they don't see it at all. 
and to be telling fools lies are like what Molly Byrne was telling yourself. If it's a lie she does be telling, she's a sweet, beautiful voice he never tired of hearing. If it was only the pig she'd have called, a crying out in the long grass maybe after her hands. It should be a fine, soft, rounded woman, I'm thinking, would have a voice like that. Mary Duell, sharply again, scandalized. Let ye not be minding if it's flat or rounded she is, for she's a flighty, foolish woman you'll hear when you're off a long way, and she making a great noise and laughing at the well. Isn't laughing a nice thing the time a woman's young? Mary Duell, bitterly. A nice thing, is it? A nice thing to hear a woman making a loud, braying laugh the like of that. And she's a great one for drawing the men, and you'll hear Timmy himself, the time he does be sitting in his forge, getting mighty fussy if she'll come walking from green, and the way you'll hear his breath gone, and he wiping his hands. Martin Duell, slightly piqued. I've heard him say a power of times is nothing at all she is when you see her at the side of you. And yet I never heard any man's breath going uneasy the time he'd be looking on yourself. I'm not the like of girls to be running around on the road, swinging their legs, and they with their necks out looking on the men. There's a power of villainy walking the world, Martin Duel. Among them that do be gading around with their gaping eyes and their sweet words, and they do no sense in them at all. Martin Duel, sadly. It's the truth, maybe. And yet I'm told it's a grand thing to see a young girl walking the road. You'd be as bad as the rest of them if you had your sight. And I did well, surely, not to marry a seeing man. Its scores would have had me in welcome, for the seeing is a queer lot, and you'd never know the thing they'd do. Martin Duell, listening. There's someone coming on the road. Let you put the pit away out of their sight, or they'll be picking it out with a spying eye as they have and saying it's rich we are, and not sparing a thing at all. They bundle away the rushes. Timmy the Smith comes in on the left. Martin Duell, with a begging voice. Leave a bit of silver for blind, Martin, your honour. Leave a bit of silver or a penny copper itself, and we'll be praying the Lord to bless you and you going the way. Timmy, stopping before them. And you letting on a while back, you knew my step. He sits down. Martin Duo with his natural voice. I know it when Molly Byrne walking in front, or when she's two perches maybe lagging behind. But it's few times I've heard you walking up the like of that, and if you'd met a ting wasn't right... And you coming on the road. Timmy, hot and breathless, wiping his face. You good ears. God bless you, if you're a liar itself, for I'm after walking up in a great haste from hearing wonders in the fair. Martin, rather contemptuously. You're always hearing queer, wonderful things, and a lot of them nothing at all, but I'm thinking this time, it's a strange thing, surely. You'd be walking up before the turn of day and not waiting below to look on them lepping or dancing or playing shows on the green of Clash. Tim huffed. I was coming to tell you, it's in this great place there'll be a bigger wonder done in a short while. Martin Duell stops working and looks at him. There was ever done on the green of Clash, or the width of Leinster itself. But you're thinking maybe, you're too cute a little fellow to be minding me at all. There'll be wonders in this place, is it? Timmy, here at the crossing of the roads. Martin Duell, amused but incredulous. I never heard tell of anything to happen in this place since the night they killed the old fellow going home with his gold. Lord have mercy on him, and threw down his corpse into the bog. Let them not be doing the like of that this night, for it's ourselves have a right to be crossing the roads, and we don't want any of your bad tricks or your wonders either, for it's wonder enough we are ourselves. <laughs> if I'd a mind be telling you a real wonder this day, and the way you'll be making a great joy maybe, you're not thinking on at all. Martin, interested. Are they putting up a still behind in the rocks? It would be a grand thing if I'd sup handy the way I wouldn't be destroying myself groping up the bogs in the rain falling. Timmy, still moodily. It's not a still they're bringing or the like of it either. Mary Duel, persuasively to Timmy. Maybe they're hanging a teeth above on the bit of tree. I'm told it's a great sight to see a man hanging by his neck. But what joy would be to ourselves and we not seen it at all? Timmy, more pleasantly. They're hanging no one this day, Mary Duel. And yet, with the help of God, you'll see a power hanged before you die. Well, you've a queer humbug talk. What way would I see a power hanged? And I a dark woman since the seventh year of my age. Timmy, did you ever hear tell of a place across a bit of sea where there is an island and the grave of the four beautiful saints? I've heard people walked around from the west and they speaking of that. Timmy, impressively. 
There's a green ferny well, I'm told, behind that place. And if you put a drop of water out of it on the eyes of a blind man, you'll make him see as well as any person in the walking world. Martin Duell with excitement. Is that the truth to me? I'm taking you telling a lie. That's the truth, Martin Duell. And you may believe it now. I re after believing a power of things weren't as likely at all. Mary Duell. Maybe we could send a young lad to bring us the water. I could wash a nagging bottle in the morning, and I think a patch would go for it if we gave him a good drink and the bit of money we have hidden the thatch. It'd be no good to be sending a sinful man the like of ourselves. But I'm told the holiness of the water does not be getting soiled with the villainy of your heart the time you'd be carrying it, and you looking round on the girls maybe are drinking a small sup at a still. Martin Duell, with disappointment. It'd be a long, terrible way to be walking ourselves. And I'm thinking that I wonder it will bring small joy to us at all. Timmy, turning on him impatiently. What is it you want with your walking? It's as deaf as blind were grown if you're not after hearing me say it's in this place the wonder would be done. Martin Duell. If it is, can't you open the big slobbering mouth you have and say what'll be done and not be making blather till the fall of night? Timmy, jumping up. I'll be going now. Mary Duell rises. And not wasting time talking civil talk with the like of you. Mary Duell, standing up, disguising her impatience. Let, let you come here to me, Timmy, and not be mine at him at all. Timmy stops, and she gropes up to him and takes him by the coat. You're not huffy with myself, and let you tell me the whole story, and don't be full of me more. Is it yourself has brought us the water? It is not, surely. Then tell us, you wonder, what person will bring it at all? It's a fine holy man will bring it, a saint of the almighty God. Mary Duell. A saint, is it? I. A fine saint who's going around the churches of Ireland with a long cloak on him and naked feet. And for he's bringing a sup of water slung at his side. And with the like of him, any little drop is enough to care to the dying or to make the blind see as clear as the grey hawks do be high up on a still day sailing the sky. Martin Duell, feeling for his stick. What place is he, Timmy? I'll be walking to him now. Let you stay quiet, Martin. He's straying and saying prayers at churches and high crosses between this place and the hills. And he, with a great crowd going behind for its fine prayers, he does be saying and fasting with it till he's thin as one of those empty verses you have there on your knee. Then he'll be coming after to this place to kill the two of you. Where after telling him the way you are, and to say his prayers in the church. Martin Duell turning suddenly to Mary Duell. And we'll be seeing ourselves this day. Oh, glory be to God. Is it true, Shirley? Mary Duell very pleased to Timmy. Maybe I'd have time to walk down and get the big shawl I have below. But I do be looking my best I've heard them say when I'm dressed up with that ting in my head. Timmy, you'd have time, surely. Martin Duell listening. Whist now. I hear people again coming by the stream. Timmy, looking out left, puzzled. It's the young girls I left walking after the saint. They're coming now. Goes up to entrance. Carrying things in their hands. And they walk in as easy as you see a child walk. We'd have a dozen eggs hidden in their bib. Martin Duell listening. That's Molly Byrne, I'm thinking. Molly Byrne and Bride come on left and cross to Martin Duell, carrying water can, saint spell, and cloak. Molly Byrne. God bless you, Martin. I've holy water here from the grave of the four saints of the West. We'll have you cured in a short while while seeing like ourselves. Timmy crosses to Molly, interrupting her. He's heard that, God help you. But where at all is the saint... And what way is he after trusting the holy water with the likes of you? Molly Byrne. He was afeard to go far away from the clouds as coming beyond. So he's gone up now through the thick woods to say a prayer to the crosses of Girion, and he's coming on this road to the church. Timmy, still astonished. And he's after leaving the holy water with the two of you? <laughs> it's a wonder, surely. Comes down left a little. Molly Byrne. The lads told him no person can carry them things to the briars, and steep, slippery feeling the rocks he'd be climbing above. So he looked round them, and gave the water and his big cloak and his belt to the two of us, for young girls, he says, are the cleanest holy people you'll see walk in the world. Mary Duell goes near seat. Mary Duell sits down, laughing at herself. <laughs> well, the saint's a simple fellow, and it's no lie. Martin Duell, leaning forward, holding out his hands. Let you give me the water in my hand, Molly Byrne. The way I'll know you have it, surely. Molly Byrne, giving it to him. Wonders is, queer things. And maybe it's Keria, and you holding it alone. Martin Duell looking round. It does not, Molly. I'm not seeing it all. He shakes the can. There's a small sup only. 
Well, isn't it a great wonder the little trifling thing would bring seeing to the blind and be shown as the big woman and the young girls and all the fine things is walking the world? He feels for Mary Duel and gives her the can. Mary shaking it. Oh, glory be to God, Martin Duel pointing to Bride. And what is it herself has, making sounds in her hand? Bride crossing to Martin Duel. It's the saint's bell. You'll hear him ringing it out at time to time. He'll be going up some place to be saying his prayers. Martin Duel holds out his hand. She gives it to him. Martin Duel ringing it. It's a sweet, beautiful sound. Mary Duel. You know, I'm thinking by the little silvery voice of it. A fasting holy man after carrying it a great way to side. Bride crosses a little right behind Martin Duel. Molly Byrne unfolding Saint's cloak. Let you stand up now, Martin Duel, till I put this big cloak on you the way we'd see how you look, and you a saint of the almighty God. Martin Duel rises, comes forward center, a little diffidently. I've heard the priests have a power of times making great talk and praises of the beauty of the saints. Molly Byrne slips cloak around him. To me, uneasily. You'd have a right to be leaving him alone, Molly. What would the saint say if he see you making game with his cloak? How would he see us and he saying prayers in the wood? She turns Martin Duel around. Isn't that a fine, holy-looking saint, Timmy the Smith? <laughs> There's a grand, handsome fellow, Mary Duel. And if you see him now, you'd be as proud I'm taken as the archangels below fell out with the almighty God. Mary Duel, with quiet confidence going to Martin Duel, feeling his cloak. It's proud will be this day, surely. Martin Duel is still ringing bell. Molly Byrne to Martin Duel. What do you think well to be all your life walking around like that, Martin Duel? A new bell ringing with the saints of God? Mary Duel turning on her fiercely. How would he be bell ringing with the saints of God and he wedded with myself? Martin Duel. It's a truce, she's saying. And if bell ringing is a fine life, yet I'm thinking maybe it's better I am wedded with the beautiful dark woman of Balinaton. Molly Byrne scornfully. You're thinking that God help you. But it's little you know of her at all. Martin Duel. It's little, surely. And I'm destroyed this day waiting to look upon her face. Timmy, awkwardly. It's well you know the way she is. For the like of you do have great knowledge in the feeling of your hands. Martin Duel, still feeling the cloak. We do, maybe. Yet it's little I know of faces or of fine, beautiful cloaks. For it's few cloaks I've had in my hand too, and few faces. For the young girls is mighty shy, Timmy the Smith. And it isn't much they heed me. Though they do be saying I'm a handsome man. Mary Duel, mockingly with good humour. Isn't it a queer thing the voice she puts on him? When you hear him talking of the skinny young looking girls and he marry with a woman he's heard called the wonder of the western world. Timmy, pityingly. The two of you will see a great wonder this day. And it's no lie. Martin Duel. I've heard tell her yellow hair and her white skin and her big eyes are a wonder, surely. Bride, who has looked out left. Here's the saint coming from the selvage of the wood. Strip the cloak from him, Molly. I will be seeing it now. Molly Byrne, hastily to Bride. Take the bell and put yourself by the stones. To Martin Duel. Will you hold your head up until I loosen the cloak? She pulls off the cloak and throws it over her arm. Then she pushes Martin Duel over and stands him besides Mary Duel. Stand there now, quiet, and let you not be saying a word. She and the Bride stand a little to their left, demurely, with a bell, etc., in their hands. Martin Duel, nervously arranging his clothes. Will you mind the way we are? And will you not tidied or washed cleanly at all? Molly Byrne. He'll not see what way you are. He'd walk by the finest woman in Ireland, I'm thinking, and not trouble to raise his two eyes to look on her face. Whist! Saint comes on left with crowd. Saint. Are these the two poor people? Timmy officiously. They are, Holy Father. They do always be sitting here at the crossing of the roads, asking a bit of copper from them that do pass or stripping rushes for lights, and they not mournful at all, but talking out straight with full voice, and making game with them that likes it. Saint, to Martin Duel and Mary Duel. It's a hard life you've had not seeing sun or moon, or the holy priest itself praying to the Lord. But it's the like of you who are brave in a bad time, will make a fine use of the gift of sights the Almighty God will bring you today. He takes his cloak and puts it about him. It's on a bare starving rock, that there's a grave of the four beauties of God, 
the way it's a little wonder. I'm thinking, if it's with bears, starving people, the water should be used. He takes the water and bell and slings them round his shoulder. So it's to the like of yourselves I do be gone, who are wrinkled and poor, a ting rich men would hardly look at or would throw a coin to or a crust of bread. Martin Duell, moving uneasily. When they look on herself, who is a fine woman, Timmy, shaking his arm, whist now, and be listening to the saint. Saint continues. If it's raggy and dirty you are itself, I'm saying, the almighty God isn't at all like the rich men of Ireland, and, with the power of the water, I'm after bringing into a little keurig into Cashel Bay, he'll have pity on you, and put sight into your eyes. Martin Duell, taking off his hat. I'm ready now, Holy Father. Saint, taking him by the hand. I'll carry you first, and then I'll come for your wife. We'll go up now into the church, for I must say a prayer to the Lord, to Mary Duel as he moves off, and let you be making your mind still and saying praises in your heart. For it's a great, wonderful thing when the power of the Lord of the world is brought upon your like. Bride, come to me, saint, waving them back. Stay back where you are, for I'm not wanting a big crowd making whispers in the church. Stay back there, I'm saying, and you do well to be thinking on the way sin has brought blindness to the world, and be saying a prayer for your own sex against false prophets and heathens and the words of women and smiths, and all knowledge that would soil the soul of the body of a man. People shrink back. He goes into church. Mary Duell gropes halfway towards the door and kneels near path. People form a group at right. Timmy. Isn't it a fine, beautiful voice he has? And he a fine, brave man if it wasn't for the fasting. Bride. Did you watch him moving in his hands? Molly Byrne. It'd be a fine thing if someone in this place could pray the like of him. For I'm taking the water from my very own blessed well do be rightly if a man knew the way to be saying prayers. And then there'd be no call to the bringing water from that wild place, where I'm told there are no decent houses or fine-looking people at all. Bride, who is looking at the door from the right. Look, at the great trembling Martin has shaking him, and he on his knees. To me, anxiously. God help him. What will he be doing when he sees his wife this day? I'm thinking it was bad work we did when we let him on. She was fine looking and not a wrinkled wizened hag the way she is. Matt Simmon. Why would he be vexed? And we after giving him great joy and pride the time he was dark. Molly Byrne, sitting down in Mary Duell's seat and tidying her hair. If it's vexed he is itself, he'll have other things now to think on as well as his wife. And what does any man care for a wife when it's two weeks or three he is looking on her face? Matt Simmon. That's the truth now, Molly. And it's more joy Dark Martin got from the lies we told of that hag is kneeling by the path than your own man will get from you, day or night, and he living at your side. Molly Byrne defiantly. Let you not be talking, Matt Simmon. For it's not yourself will be my man. Though you'd be crone and singing fine songs if you had that hope in you at all. Timmy, shocked at Molly Byrne. Let you not be raising your voice when the saint's above in his prayers. Bride, crying out, Whist! I'm thinking he's cured. Martin Duell. Oh, glory be to God! Saint, solemnly, Laus patri sit et filio cum spiritu paraclito, qui sue dono gratiae miratus est hiberne. Martin Duell, ecstatically, Oh, glory be to God! I see now, surely. I see the walls of the church and the green bits fern in them and y yourself, Holy Father, and the great width of the sky. He rushes out half foolish with joy and comes past Mary Duel as she scrambles to her feet, drawing a little away from her as he goes by. Timmy to the others. He doesn't know her at all. Saint comes out behind Martin Duel and leads Mary Duel into the church. Martin Duel comes on to the people. The men are between him and the girls. He verifies his position with his stick. That's Timmy. I know Timmy by the black of his head. That's Matt Simmon. I know Matt by the length of his legs. That should be Patch Ruid, with the gamey eyes in him and the fiery hair. He sees Molly Byrne on Mary Duel's seat, and his voice changes completely. 
Oh, it was no lie they told me, Mary Duel. Oh, glory to God and the seven saints, I didn't die and not see you at all. The blessing of God on the water and the feet carried it round through the land. The blessing of God on this day and then that brought me the saint for its grand air that you have. She lowers her head, a little confused, and soft skin, and eyes would make the saints, if they were dark a while and seeing again, fall down out of the sky. He goes nearer to her. Hold up your head, Mary. The way I'll see it's richer than I am the great kings of the east. Hold up your head, I'm saying, for it soon you'll be seeing me, and I not a bad one at all. He touches her, and she starts up. Molly Byrne. That you keep away from me, and not be soiling my chin. People laughing loudly. Martin Duell bewildered. It's Molly's voice you have. Molly Byrne. Why wouldn't I have my own voice? Do you think I am a ghost? Martin Duell. Which of all you... Which of you all is herself? He goes up to Bride. Is it... Is it you, is Mary Duell? I'm taking in more like of what they said. You have yellow hair and white skin, and is this the smell of my own turf is rising from your shawl? Bride, pulling away your shawl. I'm not your wife. Let you get out of my way. People laugh again. Is it yourself it is? You're not so fine looking, but I'm thinking you do, with the grand nose you have and your nice hands and your feet. Girl, scornfully. I've never seen any person that took me for blind, and a seeing woman, I'm thinking, would never wed the like of you. She turns away, and the people laugh once more, drawing back a little, and leaving him on their left. Try again, Martin, try again. You'll find her yet. Martin Duel, passionately. Where is it you have hidden her way? Isn't it a black shame for a drove of pitiful beasts like of you to be making a game of me, and putting a fool's head on me in the grand day of my life? And you're thinking you're a fine lot with your giggling, weeping eyes, a Fine lot to be making game of myself and the woman I've called the great wonder of the West. During his speech, which he gives with his back towards the church, Mary Duell has come out with her sight cured and come down towards the right with a silly, simpering smile till she is a little behind Martin Duell. Mary Duell. Which of you is Martin Duell? Martin Duell, wheeling round. It's her voice, surely. They stare at each other blankly. Molly Byrne to Martin Duell. Go up now. And take out another chin and be speaking the way you spoke to myself. Martin Duell, in a low voice. If I speak now, I'll speak hard to the two of you. Molly Byrne to Mary Duell. You're not saying a word, Mary. What is it you think of himself? With the fat legs on him and the little neck of a ram? Mary Duell. I'm taking it's a poor thing when the Lord God gives you sight. And books the like of that man in your way. Martin Duell. It's on your two knees you should be thanking the Lord God you're not looking at yourself. For if it was yourself, you see, you'll be running around in a short while the old strange and mad woman is running around in the glen. Mary Duell beginning to realize herself. If I'm not so fine as some of them said, I have my hair and my big eyes and my white skin. Your hair and your big eyes, is it? I'm telling you, there isn't a wisp of any grey mare on the ridge of the world as finer than the dirty twist on your head. There isn't two eyes and a starving sow isn't finer than the eyes you are calling blue like the sea. Mary Duell interrupting him. It's the devil cured you this day with your talking of sows. It's the devil cured you this day, I'm saying, and drove you crazy with lies. Martin Duell. Isn't it yourself that's after playing lies on me ten years in the day and in the night? But what is that to you now the Lord God has given eyes to me the way I could see you an old wizened hag and never fit to wear a child to me itself? Mary Duell. I wouldn't rear a crumpled whelp the like of you. It's many a woman as married with finer than yourself should be praising God if she's no child and isn't loading the earth with things that would make the heavens lonesome above and they scare in the larks and the crows and the angels passing in the sky. Martin Duell, go on now and be seeking a lonesome place where the earth can hide you away. Go on now, I'm saying, or you'll be having men and women in their knees bled and they scream to God for only one will be dark in their sight for there's no man will be bleefer than blind a hundred years or a thousand years then we'll be looking on your like. Mary Duell raising her stick. Maybe if I hit you a strong blow, you'd be blind again and having what you want. Martin Duell raising his stick and driving Mary Duell back towards left. Let you keep off me now if you wouldn't have me strike out the little handful of brains you have about on the road. 
He is going to strike her, but Timmy catches him by the arm. Timmy, have you no shame to be making a great role in the saint above saying this, Perez? Martin Duel, what is it I care for the like of him? Struggling to free himself. Let me hit her one good one for the love of Almighty God, and I'll be quiet after till I die. We wist, I'm saying. Saint, coming forward, center. Are their minds troubled with joy? Or is their sight uncertain the way it does often be the day a person is restored? Timmy. It's too certain their sight is, Holy Father. And they're after making a great fight because they're a pair of pitiful shells. Saint, coming between them. May the Lord who has given you your sight send a little sense into your heads. The way it won't be on your two selves you'll be looking, or two pitiful sinners of the earth, but on the splendor of the Spirit of God. You'll see an odd time shining out through the big hills and steep streams fall into the sea. For if it's on the like of that you do be tinkin', you'll not be minding the faces of men. But you'll be saying prayers and great praises till you'll be living the way the great saints do be living, with little but old sacks and skin covering their bones. To Timmy. Leave him go now. You're seeing he's quiet again. Timmy frees Martin Duel. And let you, Saint turns to Mary Duel, not be raising your voice. A bad thing in a woman. But let the lot of you, who have seen the power of the Lord, be thinking on it in the dark night. And be saying to yourselves the great pity and love he has for the poor, starving people of Ireland. He gathers his cloak about him. And now the Lord send blessing to you all. For I am going to Anagolan, where there is a deaf woman, and to Lara, where there are two men without sense, and to Glenasil, where there are children blind from their birth. And then I am going to sleep this night in the bed of the holy Kevin, and to be praising God and asking a great blessing on you all. He bends his head. Curtain. Act 2. Village roadside. On left the door of a forge, with broken wheels, etc. lying about. A well near center with board above it, and room to pass behind it. Martin Duell is sitting near forge, cutting sticks. Timmy, heard hammering inside forge, then calls, Let you make haste out there. I'll be putting up new fires at the turn of day, and you haven't had the half of them cut yet. Martin Duell gloomily. It's destroyed, I'll be whacking your old thorns till the turn of day. And I, with no food in my stomach, would keep the life in a pig. He turns towards the door. Let you come out here and cut them yourself if you want them cut. For there's an hour every day when a man has a right to his arrest. Timmy coming out with a hammer, impatiently. Do you want me to be driving you off again to be walking the roads? There you are now, and I give you your food in a corner to sleep and money with it. And to hear the talk of you, you'd think I was after beating you or stealing your gold. Martin Duell. You'd do it handy, maybe, if I'd gold to steal. Timmy throws down hammer, picks up some of the sticks already cut, and throws them into door. There's no fear of you having gold, a lazy, basking fool the like of you. Martin Duell. And I hear it with yourself, for it's more I got a while since, and I sitting blinding and grinning, and I get in this place where I can hard and destroy myself the length of the day. Timmy, stopping with amazement. Working hard? He goes over to him. I'll teach you to work hard, Martin Duell. Strip off your coat now and put a tuck in your sleeves and cut the lot of them while I'd rake the ashes from the forge or I'll not put up with you another hour itself. Martin Duell, horrified. Would you have me get in my desk sitting out in the black wintry air with no coat on me at all? Timmy, with authority. Strip it off now or walk down upon the road. Martin Duell, bitterly. Oh, God help me. He begins taking off his coat. I've heard tell you strip the sheets from your wife and you're putting her down into her grave, and that there isn't the like of you for plucking your living ducks the short days and leaving them running about in their skins and in great rains in the cold. He tucks up his sleeves. Ah, I've heard of how of queer things of yourself, and there isn't one of them I'll not believe from this day and be telling to the boys. Timmy, pulling over a big stick. Let you cut that now, and give me a rest from your talk, for I'm not heeding you at all. Martin Duell, taking stick. That's a hard, terrible stick, Timmy. And isn't it a poor thing to be cut in the strong timber like of that, when it's cold the bark is and slippy with the frost of the air? Timmy, gathering up another armful of sticks. What way wouldn't it be cold and it freezing since the moon has changed? He goes into the forge. 
what way indeed to me. For it's a raw, beastly day we do have each day, till I do be thinking that's well for the blind, don't be seeing the like of them grey clouds driving on the hill, and don't be looking on people with their noses red, the like of your nose, and their eyes weeping and water, and the like of your eyes, God help you, Timmy the Smith! Timmy, seen blinking in doorway. Is it turning now you are against your sight? It's a hard thing for a man to have his sight, and he living near to the like of you. He cuts a stick and throws it away, or wed with a wife cuts a stick, and I do be thinking it should be a hard thing for the Almighty God to be looking on the world bad days and on men the like of yourself walking around in it, and they slip in each way in the muck. Timmy, with pot hooks, which he taps on anvil. You'd have a right to be mind in Martin Duel, for it's a power the Saint Kier lose their sight after a while. It's well you know Mary Duel's dimming again. And I'm thinking the Lord, if he hears you making that talk, will have little pity left for you at all. Martin Duel, there's not a bit of fear of me losing my sight. And if it's a dark day itself, it's too well I see every wicked wrinkle you have around by your eye. Timmy, looking at him sharply. Dark day, is it? The day's not dark since the clouds broke in the east. Martin Duel, let ye not be tormenting yourself trying to make me afeard. You told me a power of bad lies the time I was blind. And it's right now for you to stop and be taking your rest. Mary Duell comes in unnoticed on right, with a sack filled with green stuff on her arm. For as little ease or quiet any person would get if the big folks of Ireland weren't weary at times. He looks up and sees Mary Duell. Oh, glory be to God she's coming again. He begins to work busily with his back to her. Timmy, amused, to Mary Duell as she is going by without looking at them. Look on him now, Mary Duell. You'd be a great one for keeping him steady at his work, for he's after idling and blathering to this hour from the dawn of day. Mary Duell, stiffly. Of what is it you're speaking, Timmy the Smith? <laughs> of himself, surely. Look at him there. And he with the shirt on him ripping from his back. He'd have a right to come round his night, I'm thinking, and put a stitch in his shoulders, but it's long enough you're not speaking one to another. Mary Duell. Let the two of you not torment me at all. She goes out left, with her head in the air. Martin Duell stops work and looks after her. Well, isn't it a queer thing she can't keep herself two days without looking on my face? Timmy, jeeringly. Looking on your face, is it? And she, after going by, with her head turned the way you'd see a sainted lady going where there'd be a drunken people in the side ditch singing to themselves. Martin Duell gets up and goes to the corner of Forge and looks out left. Come back here and don't mind her at all. Come back here, I'm saying. You've got no call to be spying behind her since she went off and left you in place of breaking her heart trying to keep you in the decency of clothes and food. You know rightly, Timmy. It was myself drove her away. <laughs> That's a lie you're telling. Yet it's little I care which one of you is driving the other. And let you walk back here, I'm saying, to your work. Martin Duell, turning round. I'm coming, surely. He stops and looks out right, going a step or two towards centre. On what is it you're gaping, Martin Duell? There's a person walking above. It's Molly Byrne, I'm thinking, coming down with her can. <laughs> if she is itself, let you not be idle in this day, or minding her at all, and let you hurry with them sticks, for I'll want you in the short while to be blown in the forge. He throws down pot hooks. <laughs> is it roasting me now, you'd be? He turns back and sees pot hooks. He takes them up. Pot hooks? Is it all for them you've been inside sneezing and sweating since the dawn of day? Timmy, resting himself on anvil, with satisfaction. I'm making a power of things you do have when you're setting in with a wife, Martin Duel. But I heard tell last night the saint will be passing again in a short while, and I'd have him wed Molly with myself. He'd do it, I've heard them say, for not a penny at all. Martin Duel lays down hooks and looks at him steadily. Molly will be saying great praises now to the Almighty God. And he given her a fine, stout, hearty man the like of you. And why wouldn't she, if she's a fine woman itself? Martin Duell looking upright. Why wouldn't she indeed, Timmy? The almighty God made a fine match in the two of you. For if you went marrying a woman was the like of yourself, you'd be having the fearfulest little children I'm thinking was ever seen in the world. Timmy, seriously offended. I'll forgive you. If you're an ugly man to be looking at, I'm thinking your tongue is worse than your view. Martin Duell, hurt also. Isn't it destroyed with the cold I am? And if I'm ugly itself, I never seen anyone the like of you for dreepiness in this day, Timmy the Smith. 
and I'm thinking now with herself coming above you'd have the right to step up onto your old shanty and give a rub to your face and not be sitting there with your bleary eyes and your big nose and the like of an old scarecrow stuck down upon the road. She's no call to mind what way I look, and I after building a house with four rooms in it above on the hill. But it's a queer thing the way yourself and Mary Duell are after setting every person in this place, and up beyond to Rap Vanna talking of nothing and thinking of nothing but the way they do be looking in the face. Going towards Forge. It's the devil's work you're after doing with your talk of fine looks, and I'll do right maybe to step in and wash the blackness from my eyes. He goes into Forge. Martin Duell rubs his face furtively with the tail of his coat. Molly Byrne comes on right with a water can and begins to fill it at the well. Martin Duell. God save you, Molly Byrne. Molly Byrne, indifferently. God save you. Martin Duell. It's a dark, gloomy day, and the Lord have mercy on us all. Molly Byrne. Middling dark. It's a power of dirty days and dark mornings and shabby-looking fellows. He makes a gesture over his shoulder. We do have be looking on when we have our sight... God help us, but there's one fine thing we have, to be looking on a grand, white, handsome girl the like of you. And every time I set my eyes on you, I do be blessing the saints and the holy water and the power of the Lord Almighty in the heavens above. Molly Byrne. I've heard the priest say it isn't looking on a young girl would teach many to be saying their prayers. Balling water into her can with a cup. Martin Duell. It isn't many have been the way I was, hearing your voice speaking and not seeing you at all. Molly Byrne, that should have been a queer time for an old wicked coaxing fool to be sitting there with your eyes shut and not seeing a sight of a girl or woman passing on the road. Martin Duell, if it was a queer time itself, it was a great joy and pride I had the time I'd heard your voice speaking and you passing a grin and beginning to speak with plaintive intensity. For it's of many a fine thing your voice would put a poor dark fellow in mind and the day I'd heard it, it's of little else at all I would be tinkin'. Molly Byrne, I'll tell your wife if you talk to me like that. You've heard maybe she's below picking nettles for the widow of Flynn, who took great pity on her when she seen the two of you fighting, and yourself putting shame on her at the crossing of the roads. Is there no living person can speak a score of words to me or say God speed yourself without putting me in mind of the old woman or that day you're agreeing in? Molly Byrne, I was thinking it should be a fine thing to put you in mind of the day you called the grand day of your life. Martin Duell, grand day, is it? Or a bad black day when I was roused up and found I was the like of the little children do be listening to the stories of an old woman and do be dreaming after in the dark night that it's in grand houses of gold they are with speckled horses to ride and do be waking again in short while and they destroyed with the cold and the thatch dripping maybe and the starved ass brain in the yard. Molly Byrne working indifferently. You have a great romancing this day, Martin Duell. Was it up at the still you were at the fall of night? It was not, Molly Baron, but lying down in the little rickety shed, lying down across a sop of straw, and I thinking I was seeing you walk, and hearing the sounds of your step on a dry road, and hearing you again, and you laughing and making a great talk in a high room with dry timber lining the roof. For it's a fine sound your voice has that time. And it's better I am, I'm thinking, lying down the way a blind man does be lying than to be sitting here in the grey light taking hard words from Timmy the Smith. It's queer talk you have if it's a little old shabby stump of a man you are itself. It's not so old as you do hear them say. Molly Byrne, you're old, I'm thinking, to be talking that way to a girl. Martin Duell, despondingly. It's not a lie you're telling, maybe. For it's long years I'm after losing from the world, feeling love and talking love with the old woman, and I fooled the whole while with the lies of Timmy the Smith. Molly Byrne, it's a fine way you're wanting to pay Timmy the Smith. And it's not his lies you're making love to this day, Martin Duell. <laughs> Martin Duell, it is not Molly. But with the good looks of yourself, passing behind her and coming near her left. For if it's old I am, maybe I've heard tell there are lands beyond in Kerivarig and the reeks of cork with warm sun in them, and fine light in the sky. Bending towards her, and light's a grand thing for a man ever was blind, or a woman with a fine neck and skin on her, the like of you. The way we'd have a right to go off this day till we'd have a fine life passing abroad through them towns of the south, 
A wee telling stories, maybe, or singing songs at the fairs. Molly Byrne, turning round half amused and looking him over from head to foot. Well, isn't it a queer thing when your own wife's after leaving you? Because you had a pitiful show, you'd talk the like of that to me. It's a queer thing, maybe, for all things as queer in the world. But there's one thing I'm telling you. If she walked off away from me, it wasn't because of seeing me. And I know more than I am, but because I was looking on her with my two eyes, and she getting up and eating her food, and combing her hair and lying down for her sleep. Molly, interested, off her guard. Wouldn't any married man you have be doing the like of that? Martin Duell, seizing the moment that he has her attention. I'm thinking by the mercy of God it's few sees anything but them is blind for a space. It's few sees the old woman rotten for the grave, and it's few sees the like of yourself. He bends over her, though it's shining you are, like a high lamp would drag in the ships out of the sea. Keep off me, Martin Duell. Martin Duell, quickly, with a low, furious intensity. He puts his hand on her shoulder and shakes her. You do right, I'm saying, not to marry a man as after looking out a long while in the bad days of the world. For what way would the like of him have fit the eyes to look on yourself when you rise up in the morning and come out of the little door you have above in the lane? The time you'd be a fine thing of a man would be seeing and losing his sight. The way he'd have your two eyes facing him. And he'd go on the roads and shining above them and he'd looking into the sky and springing up from the earth the time he'd lower his head in place of the muck that seeing men do meet all roads spread on the world. Molly Byrne, starting away. As the like of that talk you do hear from a man will be losing his mind. Martin Duell goes after her, passing to her right. It'd be little wonder if a man near the like of you would be losing his mind. Put down your can now. And come along with myself, for I am seeing you this day, seeing you maybe the way no man has seen you in the world. He takes her by the arm and tries to pull her away softly to the right. Let you come on now, I'm saying, to the lands of Ivor, and the reeks of cork, where you won't set down the width of your two feet and not be crushing fine flowers and making sweet smells in the air. Molly Byrne, laying down can, trying to free herself. Leave me go, leave me go, Martin Duel. Leave me go, I'm saying. Come along now. Let you come on the little path through the trees. Molly Byrne, crying out towards Forge. Timmy the Smith! Timmy comes out of the Forge, and Martin Duell lets her go. Molly Byrne, excited and breathless, pointing to Martin. Did you ever hear that them that loses their sight loses their sense along with them, Timmy the Smith? Timmy, suspicious but uncertain. He's no sense, surely. And he'll be having himself driven off this day from where he's good sleeping and feeding and wages for his work. Molly Byrne, as before. He's a bigger fool than that, Timmy. <laughs> Look on him now, and tell me if that isn't a grand fellow to think he's only to open his mouth to have a fine woman the like of me running along by his heels. Martin Duell recoils towards center, with his hand to his eyes. Mary Duell is seen on left, coming forward softly. Oh, the blind is wicked people, and it's no lie. But he'll walk off this day and not be troubling us more. He walks back left and picks up Martin Duell's coat and stick. Some things fall out of the coat pocket, which he gathers up again. Martin Duell turns round, sees Mary Duell, whispers to Molly Byrne with imploring agony. Let you not put shame on me, Molly, before herself and the smith. Let you not put shame on me and I after saying fine words to you in dream, dreams and the night. He hesitates and looks round the sky. Is it a storm of thunder is coming? Or the last end of the world? He staggers towards Mary Duel, tripping slightly over a tin can. The heavens is closing. I'm thinking with darkness and great trouble passing in the sky. He reaches Mary Duel and seizes her with both his hands, with a frantic cry. Is it the darkness of thunders coming, Mary Duel? Do you see me clearly with your eyes? Mary Duel snatches her arm away and hits him with empty sack across the face. I see your sight too clearly. And let you keep off from me now. Molly Byrne, clapping her hands. <laughs> That's right, Mary. That's the way to treat the like of him, is after standing there at my feet and asking me to go off with him, to lad grow an old wretched road woman the like of yourself. Mary Duel defiantly. When the skin shrinks in her chin, Molly Byrne, there won't be the like of you for a shrug hag in the four quarters of Ireland. <laughs> it's a fine pair you'd be, surely. Martin Duel is standing at back right center with his back to the audience. Timmy, coming over to Mary Duel. Is it no shame you have to let on she'd ever be the like of you? Mary Duel. 
It's them that's fat and flabby, dooby wrinkled young. And that whitish yellowy hair she does soon be turned to the like of a handful of thin grass you'd see rotten where the wet lies at the north of a sty. Turning to go out on right. Ah, uh, isn't it a grand thing for the like of your make to be sitting fools mad a short while, and that it be turned in a ting will drive off the little children from your feet. She goes out. Martin Duell has come forward again, mastering himself, but uncertain. Timmy. Oh, God protect us, Molly, from the words of the blind. He throws down Martin Duell's coat and stick. There's your old rubbish now, Martin Duell. Let you take it up, for that it's all you have. And if I ever meet you coming again, if it's seeing or blind you at itself, I'll bring out the big hammer and hit you a welt with it to leave you easy till the judgment day. Martin Duell, rousing himself with an effort. What call have you to talk the like of that with myself? Timmy, pointing to Molly Byrne. It's well you know what call I have. It's well you know a decent girl I'm taking to wed has no right to have her heart scalded with hearing talk and queer bad talk I'm taking from a raggy looking fool the like of yourself. It's making game of you, she is. But what seeing girl would marry with yourself? Look on him, Molly. Look on him, I'm saying, for seeing him still and let you raise your voice. For the time has come and bid him go up into his forge and be sitting there by himself, sneezing and sweating and he beating pot hooks till the judgment day. He seizes her arm again. Molly Byrne. Keep him off of me, Timmy. Timmy, pushing Martin Duel aside. Would you have me strike you, Martin Duel? Go along now after your wife, who's a fit match for you, and leave Molly with myself. Martin Duel, despairingly. Won't you raise your voice, Molly? And lay hell's long curse on his tongue. Molly Byrne, on Timmy's left. I won't be telling him it's destroyed I am with the sight of you and the sound of your voice. Go off now after your wife. And if she beats you again, lets you go after the tinker's girls as above run in the hills or down among the sluts of the town. And you'll hear one day, maybe, the way a man should speak with a well-reared civil girl the like of me. She takes Timmy by the arm. Come up now, into the forge till he's gone down a bit on the road. For it's near a fear I am with the wild look he has come in his eyes. She goes into the forge. Timmy stops in the doorway. Let me not find you out here again, Martin Duell. He bears his arm. It's well you know, Timmy the Smith has great strength in his arm, and it's a power of things it has broken a sight harder than the old bone of your skull. He goes into the forge and pulls the door after him. Martin Duell stands a moment with his hand in his eyes. And that's the last thing I'm to set my sight on in the life of the world. The villainy of a woman and the bloody strength of a man. Oh, God, pity a poor blind fellow the way I am this day with no strength in me to do hurt to them at all. He begins groping about for a moment, then stops. Yet if I have no strength in me, I have a voice left for my prayers. And may God blight them this day, and my own soul the same hour with them the way I'll see them after. Molly Byrne and Timmy the Smith, the two of them in a high bed and the screeching in hell. And it'll be a grand thing that time to look on the two of them and they twisting and roaring out and twisting and roaring again one day and the next day and each day I always and ever. It's not blind I'll be that time and it won't be hell to me I'm taking but the like of heaven itself and it's Fine care I'll be taking the Lord Almighty doesn't know. He turns to grope out. Curtain. Act 3. Same as in first act, but gap in center has been filled with briars or branches of some sort. Mary Duell, blind again, gropes her way in on left and sits as before. She has a few rushes with her. It is an early spring day. Mary Duell, mournfully. Oh, God help me. God help me, the blackness wasn't so black at all the other times that it is this time. And it's destroyed I'll be now, and hard set to get my living working alone when it's few are passing and the winds are cold. She begins shredding rushes. I'm taking short days will be long days to me from this time. And I sitting here not seeing a blink, or hearing a word, and no thought in my mind but long prayers that Martin Duell get his reward in a short while for the villainy of his art. It's great jokes the people will be making now, I'm thinking. 
and they passing me by, pointing their fingers maybe and asking what place is himself. The way it's no quiet or decency I'll have from this day till I'm an old woman with long white hair and it twisting from my brow. She fumbles with her hair and then seems to hear something. There's a queer slouching step coming on the road. God help me, he's coming, surely. She stays perfectly quiet. Martin Duell gropes in on right, blind also. Martin Duell, gloomily. The old devil men married Duel for putting lies on me, and letting on she was grand. The devil men the old saint for letting me see it was lies. He sits down near her. The devil men Timmy the Smith for killing me with hard work, and keeping me with an empty, windy stomach in me in the day and in the night. Ten thousand devils men the soul of Molly Byrne, Mary Duell nods her head with approval, and the bad, wicked souls is hidden in all the women of the world. He rocks himself with his hand over his face. It's a lonesome I'll be from this day. And if living people is a bad lot, yet Mary Duel herself, and she a dirty, wrinkled looking hag, was better maybe to be sitting along with than no one at all. I'll be getting my death now, I'm thinking, sitting alone in the cold air. Hear them in the night coming and the blackbirds flying round and the briars crying to themselves. The time you'll hear one cart getting off a long way in the east and another cart getting off a long way in the west. And a dog barking, maybe. And a little wind turning the sticks. I'll be destroyed sitting alone. And losing my senses this time the way I'm after losing my sight. For it would make any person afeard to be sitting up here in the sound of his breath. He moves his feet on the stones. And the noise of his feet. When it's a power of queer things. Do be stirring little sticks breaking and the grass moving. Mary Duell half sighs. And he turns on her in horror. <laughs> Till you take your dying oath on sun and moon a thing was breathing on the stones. He listens towards her for a moment, then starts up nervously and gropes about for his stick. I'll be going now, I'm thinking, but I'm not sure what place my stick's in, and I'm destroyed with terror and dread. He touches her hand as he is groping about and cries out. <gasps> There's a thing with cold living hand on it sitting at my side. He turns to run away, but misses his path and stumbles in against the wall. My road is lost on me now. Oh, merciful God, set my foot on the path this day, and I'll be saying prayers morning and night, and I'll be straining my ear after young girls, or do any bad thing till I die. Mary Duel, indignantly. Let ye not be telling lies to the Almighty God. Martin Duel. Mary Duel, is it? Recovering himself with immense relief. Is it Mary Duel, I'm saying? Mary Duel. There's a sweet tone in your voice, I'm not her for a space. You're taking me for Molly Byrne, I'm thinking. Martin Duell coming towards her, wiping sweat from his face. Well, sight's a queer ting for an upsetting man. It's a queer ting to think I'd live this day to be fair in the like of you. But if it's shaken I am for a short while, I'll soon be coming to myself. Mary Duell. You'll be grand then. And it's no lie. Martin Duell, sitting down shyly, some way off. No call to be talking, for I've heard your tell as blind as myself. If I am, I'm better in mind I'm married to a little dark stump of a fellow looks the fool of the world, and I'll be better in mind from this day the great hullabaloo he's after making from hearing a poor woman breathing quiet in her place. And you'll be better in mind, I'm thinking, what you see a while back when you looked down into a well, or a clear pool maybe where there was no wind stirring and great light in the sky. Mary Duel, I'm minding that, Shirley. For if I'm not the way the liars were saying below, I seen a ting in them pools put joy and blessing in my heart. She puts her hand on her hair again. Martin Duell, laughing ironically. <laughs> well, they were saying below I was losing my senses, but I never went any day the length of that. God help you, Mary Duell. If you're not a wonder for looks, you're the maddest female woman is walking the countries of the East. Mary Duell, scornfully. You were saying all times you'd a great ear for hearing the lies and word. A great ear, God help you. And you think you're using it now. If it's not lies you're telling, 
Would you have me think you're not a wrinkled poor woman is looking the like of three scores, maybe two scores and a half? Mary Duel, I would not, Martin. She leans forward earnestly. For when I seen myself in them pools, I seen my hair would be grey or white maybe in a short while. And I seen with it that I'd a face would be a great wonder when I'd have a soft white hair fallen around it. The way when I'm an old woman, there won't be the like of me, surely, in the seven counties of the East. Martin Duell, with real admiration. You're a cute, thinking woman, Mary Duell, and it's no lie. Mary Duell, triumphantly. I am, surely. And I'm telling you a beautiful white-haired woman is a grand thing to see. For I'm told when Kitty Bowne was selling poteen below, the young man itself would never tire to be looking in her face. Martin Duell, taking off his hat and feeling his head, speaking with hesitation. Did you think to look, Mary Duell? Would there be a whiteness the like of that coming upon me? Mary Duell, with extreme contempt. On you, God help you? In a short while you'll have a head on you as bald as an old turnip you'd see rolling around in the muck. You need never talk again of your fine looks, Martin Duell, for the day of that talk's gone forever. Martin Duell. That's a hard word to be saying. But I was thinking if I had a bit of comfort the like of yourself, it's not far off we'd be from the good days went before. And that'd be a wonder, surely. But I'll never rest easy thinking you're a grey, beautiful woman and myself a pitiful show. I can't help your looks, Martin Duell. It wasn't myself made you with your rat's eyes and your big ears and your grizzly chin. Martin Duell rubs his chin ruefully, then beams with delight. There's one thing you forgot, if you're a cute, thinking woman itself. Your slouching feet, is it? Or your hooky neck, or your two knees is black with knocking one another. There's talking for a cute woman. There's talking, surely. Mary Duell, puzzled at the joy in his voice. If you'd anything but lies to say, you'd be talking to yourself. Martin Duell, busting with excitement. <laughs> I've this to say, Mary Duell. I've been letting my beard grow in a short while. A beautiful, long, white, silken, streamy beard. And you wouldn't see the like of it in the Eastern world. Ah, a white beard's a grand thing on an old man. A grand thing for making the quality stop and be stretching out their hands with good silver and gold. And a beard's a good thing you'll never have. So you may be holding your tongue. Mary Duell, laughing cheerfully. <laughs> well, we're a great pair, surely, and it's great times we'll have yet, maybe, and great talking before we die. Martin Duell, great times from this day, with the help of the Almighty God, for a priest itself would believe the lies of an old man who would have a fine white beard grown on his chin. Mary Duell, there's the sound of one of them twittering yellow birds to be coming in springtime from beyond the sea, and there'll be a fine warmth now in the sun. And the sweetness in the air, the way it'll be grand thing, we'll be sitting here quiet and easy, smelling the things growing up and budding from the earth. I'm smelling the furs a while back sprouting on the hill. And if you'd hold your tongue, you'd hear the lamps on greening. Though it's near drowned, they're crying as with the full river making noises in the glen. Mary Duel listens. The lamps is bleating, surely. And there's cocks and laying ends making a fine stir a mile off on the face of the hill. She starts. Martin Duell. What is that sounding in the west? A faint sound of a bell is heard. Mary Duell. It's not the churches, for the wind's blowing from the sea. Martin Duell, with dismay. It's the old saint, I'm thinking, ringing his bell. Mary Duell. The Lord protect us from the saints of God. He's coming this road, surely. Martin Duell, tentatively. Will we be running off, Mary Duell? What place will we run? Martin Duell. There's the little path going up through the sluice. If we reach the bank above, where the elves do be grown, no person would see a sight of us. If it was a hundred yeomen were passing itself. But I'm afraid after the time we were with our sight, we'll not find a way to it at all. Mary Duell, standing up. You'd find the way, surely. You're a grand man, and the world knows that finding it a way if there was a deep snow itself lying on the earth. Martin Duell, taking her hand. Come a bit this way. It's here it begins. They grope about Gap. There's a tree pulled into the Gap. A strange thing happened since I was passing before. Mary Duell. Would we have a right to be crawling in below under the sticks? Martin Duell. It's hard set I am to know what would be right. And it's a poor thing to be blind when you can't run off itself and you fear in the sea. Mary Duell, nearly in tears. <laughs> it's a poor thing, God help us.
And what good will our grey hairs be itself? If we have our sight the way, we'll see them falling each day and turning dirty in the rain. The bell sounds nearby. Martin Duell, in despair. He's coming now, and we won't get off from him at all. Mary Duell, could we hide in the bit of briars growing at the west part of the church? We'll try that, Charlie. He listens a moment. I to make haste. I hear them trampling in the wood. They grope over to church. Mary Duell, it's the words of the young girls making a great stir in the trees. They find the bush. Here's the briar on my left, Martin. I'll go first. I'm the big one, and I'm easy to see. Martin Duell, turning his head anxiously. It's easy heard you are. And will he be holding your tongue? Mary Duell, partly behind bush. Come in out beside of me. They kneel down, still clearly visible. Do you think they can see us now, Martin Duell? I'm thinking they can't. But I'm hard set to know for the lot of them young girls, the devil save them of sharp, terrible eyes, would pick out a poor man I'm thinking, and he lying below hid in his grave. Let you not be whispering sin, Martin Duell. Or maybe it's the finger of God they be pointing to ourselves. It's yourself is speaking madness, Mary Duel. Haven't you heard the saints say it's the wicked do be blind? If it is, you'd have a right to speak a big, terrible world would make the water not cure us at all. What way would I find a big, terrible world and I shook with the fear and if I did itself? who know rightly if it's good words or bad words to save us this day from himself? They're coming. I hear their feet on the stones. Saint comes in on the right with Timmy and Molly Byrne in holiday clothes. The others, including Matt Simmon and Pat Shrewd, as before. Timmy. I've heard tell Martin Duell and Mary Duell were seen this day about on the road, Holy Father. And we were thinking you'd have pity on them and cure them again. I would, maybe. But where are they at all? I'll have little time left when I have the two of you to wed in the church. Matt Simmon. At their seat. There are the rushes they do have lying round on the stones. It's not far off they'll be, surely. Molly Byrne. Pointing with astonishment. Look beyond, Timmy. They all look over and see Martin Duel. Timmy. Well, Martin's a lazy fool to be lying in there at the height of the day. Let you get up out of that. You were near losing a great chance by your sleepiness this day, Martin Duel. <laughs> the two of them's in it, God help us all. Martin Duel, scrambling up with Mary Duel. What is it you want, Timmy, that you can't leave us in peace? Timmy. The saints come to marry the two of us. And I'm after speaking a word for yourselves, the way he'll be curing you now, that if you're a foolish man itself, I do be pitying you. But I've a kind heart, when I think of you sitting dark again and you after seeing a while and working for your bread. Martin Duell takes Mary Duell's hand and tries to grope his way off right. He has lost his hat, and they are both covered with dust and grass seeds. People, you're going wrong! It's this way, Martin Duell! They push him over in front of the saint near center. Martin Duell and Mary Duell stand with piteous hangdog dejection. Saint, let you not be afeard, but there's great pity with the Lord. Martin Duell, we ain't afeard, Holy Father. Saint, it's many a time those that are cured well of the four beauties of God lose their sight when a time is gone. But those I cure a second time will go unseen till the hour of death. He takes the cover from his can. Of a few drops only left of the water. But with the help of God, it'll be enough for the two of you, and let you kneel down now upon the road. Martin Duell wheels round with Mary Duell and tries to get away. You can kneel down here, I'm saying. We'll not trouble this time going to the church. Timmy, turning Martin Duell round angrily. Are you going mad in your head, Martin Duell? It's here you to kneel. Did you not hear his reverence and he's speaking to you now? Saint, Kneel down, I'm saying. The ground's dry at your feet. Martin Duell, with distress. Let you go on your way, Holy Father. We're not calling you at all. Saint, I'm not saying a word of penance or fasting itself. So you've no call now to be fearing me. But let you kneel down till I give you your sight. Martin Duell, more troubled. We're not asking our sight, Holy Father. And let you be walking on and leaving us to our peace at the crossing roads, but it's best we are this way, and we're not asking to see. Saint to people. Is his mind gone that he's no wish to be cured this day? And looking out on the wonders of the world. Martin Duell. It's wonders enough I've seen in a short space for the life of one man only. Timmy. Is it he see wonders? Patrud. He's making game. Matt Simon. He's maybe drunk, Holy Father. 
Saint, severely. I never heard tell of any person wouldn't have great joy to be looking on the earth, and the image of the Lord is thrown upon men. Martin Duell, raising his voice by degrees. That's great sights, Holy Father. What was it I seen my first day but your own bleed and feet, and they cut with stones in my last day but the villainy of herself that your wedding God forgive you with Timmy the Smith? That was great sights, maybe. And wasn't it great sights seeing the roads when north winds would be driving and the skies would be harsh and you'd see the horses and the asses and the dogs itself, maybe, with their heads hanging and they closing their eyes, Timmy. There's talking. Matt Simmon. He's right, maybe. It's lonesome living when the days are dark. Molly Byrne. He's not right. Let you speak up, Holy Father, and confound him now. Saint, coming close to Martin Duell and putting his hand on his shoulder. Did you never set eyes on the summer and the fine spring in the places where the holy men of Ireland have built up churches to the Lord, that you'd wish to be closed up and seeing no sight of the glittering seas? and the firs is opening above will soon have the hills shining as if it was fine creels of gold they were, rising into the sky. Patruid, that's it, Holy Father. Matt Simmon, what have you to say now, Martin Duell? Martin Duell, fiercely, isn't it finer sights ourselves have a while since we sit in dark, smelling the sweet, beautiful smells do be rising in the warm nights and hearing the swift flying things racing in the air? Saint draws back from him till we'd be looking up in our own minds into a grand sky and seeing lakes and broadening rivers and hills are waiting for the spade and plow. Matt Simmon, roaring laughing. <laughs> it's songs he's making now, Holy Father. Patch, it's mad he is. Molly Byrne, it's not. But how lazy he is, Holy Father, and not wishing to work for a while since he was all times longing and screeching for the light of day. Martin Duell, turning on her. If I was... I've seen my fill in a short while with the look of my wife, and of your own wicked grin, Molly Byrne, the time you're making game with a man. <laughs> my grin, is it? Let you not mind him more, Holy Father, but leave him in darkness, if it's that it's best fitting to the blackness of his heart. Timmy, cure Mary Duel, your reverence, who is a quiet poor woman, never said a harsh word, but when she'd be vexed with himself, or with the young girls do be making game of her below. People, that's it, cure Mary Duel, your reverence. Saint, this is a little use, maybe, talking to the like of him. But if you have any sense, Mary Duel, kneel down at my feet, and I'll bring the sight into your eyes. Martin Duel, more defiantly, you will not, Holy Father. Would you have her looking on me and saying hard words to me till the day of my death? Saint, severely, if she's wishing her sight, it isn't the like of you will stop her. To Mary, kneel down, I'm saying. Mary Duel, doubtfully. Let us be as we are, Holy Father, and then we'll be known again as the people as happy and blind, and we'll be having an easy time with no trouble to live, and we get in half pence on the road. Molly Byrne, let ye not be raven. Kneel down and get your sight, and let himself be taken half pence if he likes it best. Timmy, if it's choosing a willful blindness you are, there isn't any one will give you a half worth of a meal, or doing the little things you need to keep you at all living in the world. Matt Simmon, if you have your sight... You could be keeping a watch that no other woman came near him at all. Mary Duell, half persuaded. That's true, maybe. Saint, kneel down, for I must be hastening with the marriage and going my own way before the fall of night. People, all together, kneel down, Mary. Kneel down when you're bid by the saint. Mary Duell, looking uneasily towards Martin Duell. Maybe it's right they are. And I will if you wish it, Holy Father. She kneels down. Saint takes off his hat and gives it to someone near him. All the men take off their hats. He goes forward a step to take Martin Duell's hand away from Mary Duell. Saint to Martin Duell. Go aside now. We're not wanting you here. Martin Duell pushes him away roughly and stands with his left hand on Mary Duell's shoulder. Keep off yourself, Holy Father, and let you not be taken my arrest from me in the darkness of my wife. What call have the like of you to be coming in here when you're not wanted at all? and making a great mess with the holy water you have the length of your prayers. Go on now, I'm saying, and leave us this place on the road. Saint, if it was a seeing man I heard talking to me the like of that, I put a black curse on him would weigh down his soul till it'd be fallen to hell. But you're a poor, blind sinner, God forgive you, and I do not mind you at all. He raises his can. 
go aside now, till I give the blessing to your wife, and if you won't go with your own will, there are those standing by will make you surely. Martin Duel, pulling Mary Duel. Make me, is it? Well, there's cruel hardship in the pity of your like. And what is it you want coming for to break our happiness and our rest? Let you rise up, Mary, against them and not heed them any more. Saint, imperiously to people, let you take that man and drive him down on the road. Matt Simon, come on now, Martin, come on. Patchwood, come off now from talking badness to the holy saint. Martin Duel, throwing himself down on the ground, clinging to Mary Duel. I'll not come. I am saying and let you take this holy water to cure the blackness of your souls today. Mary Duel, putting her arm around him. Leave him easy, holy father. When I leave her live dark all times besides him, then be seen in new troubles now. Saint, you've taken your choice. Drag him away. People, that's it. Lift his head. They carry him to right. Martin Duel, screaming. Make them leave me go, holy father. Make them leave me go and let you have pity and forgive me for my heathen words. And you may cure her this day, holy father, and do anything that you will. Saint to people. Let him be if his senses come to him at all. They put him down. Martin Duel shakes himself loose, feels for Mary Duel, sinking his voice to a plausible whine. You may cure herself, surely, Holy Father. I wouldn't stop you at all, and it's great joy she'll have looking on your face. But let you cure myself along with her, the way I'll see when it lies she telling, and be looking out day and night upon the holy men of God. He kneels down a little before Mary Duel. Saint, speaking half to the people. Men who are dark a long while are thinking over queer thoughts in their heads, on the like of simple men, who do be working every day, and praying and living like ourselves. And with that, it's my part to be showing a love to you who would take pity on the worst that live. So if you've found a right mind at the last minute itself, I'll cure you. If the Lord will, and not be thinking of the hard, foolish words you're after saying this day to us all. Martin Duel, listening eagerly. I'm waiting now, Holy Father. Saint, with can in his hand, close to Martin Duel. With the power of the water from the grave of the four beauties of God. With the power of this water, I'm saying, that I put upon your eyes. He raises can. Martin Duel, with a sudden movement, strikes the can from Saint's hand and sends it rocketing across stage. People with a terrified murmur. Will you look at what he's done? Oh, glory be to God, there's a villain, surely. Martin Duel stands up triumphantly and pulls Mary Duel up. If I'm a poor, dark sinner, I've sharp ears, God help me. And it's well I heard the little splash of the water you had there in the can. Go on now, Holy Father. For you're a fine saint itself. It's more sense is in a blind man and more power maybe than you're thinking at all. Let you walk on now with your own worn feet, and your welted knees, and your fasting holy ways have left you a big head on you, and thin pitiful arms. People, go on from this. Saint looks at Martin Duel for a moment severely, then turns away and picks up his can. Martin Duel, we're going, surely. For if it's right some of you have to be working and sweating the like of Timmy the Smith, and a right some of you had to be fasting and praying and talking holy talk the like of yourself, I'm thinking it's a good right ourselves have to be sitting blind, here in the soft wind turning around the little leaves of the spring and feeling the sun, and we not tormenting our souls with the sight of the grey days and the holy men and the dirty feet is trampling the world. He gropes towards his stone with Mary Duel. Matt Simon. It'd be an unlucky, fearful thing I'm thinking to have the like of that man living near us at all. Wouldn't he be bringing down a curse upon us, Holy Father, from the heavens of God? Saint, trying his girdle. God has great mercy, but great wrath for them that sin. People, all together. Go on now, Martin Duel. Go on from this place. Let you not be bringing great storms and draughts on us, maybe from the power of the Lord. Some of them throw things at him. Martin Duel, turning round defiantly and picking up a stick. Keep off now, the yelping lot of you, or it's more than one maybe will get a bloody head on him from the welt of my stick. Keep off now, and let you not be afeard, for we're going on the two of us to the towns of the south, where the people will have kind voices maybe, and we won't know their bad looks or their villainy at all. Mary Duel, that's the truth, surely, 
and we'd have a right to be gone, and it's a long way itself where you do have to be walking with a slow of wet on one side, and a slow on the other, and you go on a stony path with a north wind blowing behind. Men. Go on now, get on from this place. Martin Duel. Keep off, I'm saying. He takes Mary Duel's hand again. Come along now, and we'll be walking to the south. For we've seen too much of everyone in this place, and it's small joy we'd have living near them, or hearing the lies they do be telling from the grey of dawn till the night. They go. There's a power of deep rivers with floods in them where you do have to be lep in the stones and you go into the south. So I'm thinking the two of them will be drowned together in a short while, surely. Saint, they have chosen their lot, and the Lord have mercy on their souls. He rings his bell. And let the two of you come up now into the church, Molly Byrne and Timmy the Smith, till I make your marriage and put my blessing on you all. He turns to the church, procession forms, and the curtain comes down as they go slowly into the church. Curtain. And that is the end of The Well of the Saints. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, you might have noticed that my recording sounds a little bit different. I am now currently in Ireland, and uh, I am sitting in my room with my mattress turned up on its side and having the mic directly in front of the mattress so that it gets none of the background sound. So hopefully it sounds decent. Uh, hopefully I'm still as articulate as before, um, even though we all know that is very much difficult for me to do. <laughs> anyway. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I hope to have you back in Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner. Thank you. <laughs>